Hello everyone, I'm Yu Peng Zhang, and uh, today I'm going to talk about the applications of zero-knowledge proof uh, beyond blockchains and cryptocurrencies. So uh, the first uh, application that I'm going to talk about is uh, for machine learning. Uh, as uh, you may already know, machine learning is used everywhere in our daily lives now. For example, it can be used in uh, uh, financial applications for credit risk predictions, and it is being used in criminal justice to, to predict the future recommitment of crimes, and also it's uh, being widely used in the healthcare uh, domain. But in many of these scenarios, the machine learning models are actually secret assets or intellectual properties of these entities, and they're not willing to share the machine learning models with the public. So in this case, as a regular user, how can we make sure that these machine learning models are making fair decisions? We merely receive the final answer of these machine learning models without any justifications. So it turns out zero-knowledge proof can provide a potential solution to achieve the best of both worlds. Using zero-knowledge proofs, we can actually view this machine model as a secret witness of the prover. And using zero-knowledge proof, uh, these entities can generate a proof proving that the machine model satisfies certain notion of fairness, and later the decision is indeed made by the same machine learning model. And uh, everyone else in the public can actually verify the proof, ensuring the correctness of these claims. So in this way, we can actually ensure the integrity of these uh, properties of machine models without compromising the confidentiality of the models. So that is a cool application of a zero-knowledge proof. But then you may wonder what are the challenges. We've been talking about the general purpose zero-knowledge proof constructions throughout the lectures. So why can't we just use any of these uh, protocols and implement a machine learning uh, inference or accuracy or fairness testing using these protocols and then call it a solution? Well, the challenge is on the efficiency and scalability of uh, these snarks. So, uh, roughly speaking, for almost all of the existing uh, protocols we've seen so far, they at most can scale to about 2 to the 30, that is 1 billion gates on a quite powerful machine. And it really takes minutes to hours to generate such a proof. And if you take an, an example from the machine learning domain, for example, this VG16, that is a convolutional neural network on the dataset of CFR10, the model itself contains 15 million parameters. And if you implement a single inference naively as a circuit, the circuit would have uh, 1.1 billion gates. Which means that it will take hours or to even days to generate a single proof. And even if you're willing to wait for such a long time, it's not going to happen because of the memory limitation. So uh, then the potential solution to this uh, problem is to actually design special purpose zero-knowledge proofs for common computations involved in machine learning algorithms. And here, I'm showing you an example of a neural network, where we basically have a fully connected layers with uh, matrix modifications. We have uh, convolutional layers with 2D convolutions. And we have a uh, common activation functions like ReLU, SoftMax, uh, uh, Sigmoid, and we have a uh, max pooling and softmax. So there is a handful of uh, common computations involved in the machine learning uh, algorithm. And if we can design special purpose zero knowledge proof protocols for these computations, uh, we, we uh, will be able to have a more efficient and scalable zero knowledge proof protocols for a large class of uh, machine learning uh, computations. So that is the idea uh, of this line of research. And this idea has been proven true uh, in this paper by Justin Taylor in 2013, where he proposed a special purpose protocol based on the sum check protocol for matrix modifications. And here I'm showing you the standard definition of a matrix modification, C equals to A times B. And the equation is uh, very straightforward, Cij equals to summation of Aik times Gkj. Then very naturally, you can actually uh, model this relationship of matrix allocation as a polynomial equation. Cxy equals to the summation of Axz times Bzy, where these polynomials are actually defined by three matrices, such that Cij equals to the element Cij. 
and so uh, so does A and B. And here I'm abusing notation a little bit, where the bold letters means the a vector. So these are actually multivariate polynomials, and I is like the a bit representation of the index i, and the cij equals to the element cij with the number index i and j. So then based on this multivariate polynomial equation, it is actually possible to have a very efficient sum check protocol to prove the correctness of this equation. And the prover time is only order of uh, n square. And the proof size is order of log n. And note that this actually is faster than computing the result of matrix multiplication, which takes cubic time if you're doing it naively, and even if you're using the best theoretical algorithm, it still takes an order of n to the 2.37 something. And the reason why this is possible is because we are verifying the relationship between the output and the input of the computation, instead of uh, computing it from scratch. So because of this um, uh, observation idea, it is actually given the result of the computation, it is possible to have a zero knowledge proof proving the correctness of the result, and the running time is sublinear in the time of the computation. So the additional time to generate such a proof is actually even smaller than the time spent on the computation itself. So this is a, a very cool protocol proposed in this paper. And uh, later in a paper, in our paper in 2021 by Liu, Xie, and Zhang, we were able to design another sum check protocol and the corresponding zero knowledge proof protocol for 2D convolutions. And here I'm showing you uh, an example of a 2D convolution, which is very commonly used to for for uh, image uh, uh, classification uh, uh, problems in neural networks, convolutional neural networks. So. Uh, basically, we have an image and a kernel, and uh, we are sliding this kernel throughout the image, take the element-wise product, and sum it up to get one value of uh, the output. And this uh, computation is called 2D convolution, and I'm using c equals to a star b to denote it. Again, computing it naively would take order of capital N times capital K time which is uh, the capital N is the total size of the image, and capital K is the total size of the kernel. And if you want to generate the proof with such a complexity, that would be beyond the scalability of existing uh, zero-knowledge proof uh, protocols. So can we do better than that? And the key idea of uh, this new protocol from convolution is as follows. So first, we can actually view the 2D convolution as a one-dimensional convolution if you align the indices uh, properly. So, uh, this equation c equals to a star b as vectors is actually almost exactly the same as the 2D convolution with the property indices. And then it is actually a well-known fact that the convolution is the same as the polynomial multiplication. cx equals to ax times bx, where the coefficients of these two polynomials are from these two vectors a and b, and after multiplication, the coefficients of cx is exactly the vector c. And then this polynomial multiplication can actually be computed by the standard classical fast Fourier transform algorithm. Basically, you take the FFT of AX, FFT of uh, BX, and uh, do the element-wise product and compute the inverse FFT, you can get the coefficients of C of X. So now let's just focus on proving the computation of a single FFT. Again, very naturally, it can be modeled as a polynomial equation. And here, a bar x is defined by the output vector of f of t, and a y is de defined by the input vector of f of t. And this uh, polynomial f x y is defined by the Fourier matrix using the root of unity. And again, these are all multivariate polynomials. Unfortunately, if you run a sum check protocol for this polynomial equation, the proof time would be quadratic in n. And that is because the size of this matrix is n squared. So the size of this polynomial fxy is already n squared, if you want to merely write it down. And the key observation why we can actually do better is that although the size of this matrix is n squared, it only consists of uh, n distinct values because of the property of the root of unity. And it has this very nice structure 
like this. So based on this observation, it is actually possible to design a better sum check protocol where the prover time is only order of n that is linear in one dimension of this uh, vector and matrices. And the proof size is order of log n and the verifier is only uh, order of log n square. Again, this is actually sublinear in the original computation of FFT, which takes order of n times log n time. So, uh, in addition to the protocol for convolutions, in this paper we also have some special protocols for ReLU, max pooling, and so forth. And putting everything together, here is the performance of this system called ZKC in it. So, uh, in this paper, it is actually possible to generate a proof for this VG16 convolutional neural network on the data set of CIFAR10 and in uh, about uh, 90 seconds for one inference. And the proof size is actually significantly smaller than the size of the model itself, and the verifier time is even faster than computing the inference uh, directly. And you can also actually generalize it to testing the accuracy of uh, uh, like 100 images with uh, the performance like this. So this shows you the idea of this designing special purpose protocols for these common computations, and we can achieve sublinear prover time in the time of the original computation, given the result of the computation, which was not possible for general purpose zero-knowledge proofs. And finally, there I also want to highlight other related works on a zero-knowledge proof for machine learning. So recently, this has become a very active research direction with a lot of interest from both academia and the industry. And there are papers for zero-knowledge proof for decision trees, and then BCN, Zen, Mystique, and PVCN, and in the most recent paper by Kang, uh, Hashimoto, Stoka, Stoka and, the, uh, and Sun, they were able to uh, support the inference of uh, ImageNet on a much larger scale. And the proof system is actually based on the Planck system. And they were designing some uh, uh, special Planckish optimization for matrix allocations and inner products, and also support ReLU functions using lookup arguments. So this is really a very active and interesting line of research. The second application I want to talk about is for program analysis. And the setting of uh, this application is uh, shown as uh, follows. So here, in the first kind of application, we can assume that the prover has this uh, secret program like the source code of the program. And uh, he doesn't want to release the source code to the public. So then we are interested in some properties of this program. For example, the safety properties, like there's no buffer overflow uh, vulnerability in this program. Now, how can we do that without accessing the source code? Well, we can actually uh, have a public computation on this secret uh, source code. And this computation is, uh, can be a static analysis algorithm. For example, a taint analysis or interval analysis or control flow graph, uh, control flow analysis on the secret program. And then using a zero knowledge proof to prove the result of this computation would uh, tell you that the program satisfies certain safety properties. And later, it can also generate another zero knowledge proof for running the program on uh, some specific input, giving a specific output without revealing the secret source code of this program. So in another related application, so this time we are interested in the vulnerabilities of a program. So in this setting, uh, we can think of the program as the public. We can have the public libraries, for example, the open SSL library. And then some security researchers may uh, have found some um, vulnerabilities of uh, this program, a, a secret input that will trigger the crash of the program. So uh, currently, we have to disclose this uh, vulnerability either to the owner of, uh, of the library or to some regulators or, or eventually to the public. And there could be some uh, issues with the bug bounty process and the disclosure process. So then uh, using zero knowledge proof, there are several recent papers proposing uh, an alternative solution. So now we can actually use the zero knowledge proof to prove that we know a vulnerability or a secret input such that if you run this public program on this secret input, it will eventually lead to the crash of the program 
to a, a particular uh, state of the, of the program. And by running the zero-knowledge proof, we can actually prove to the owner of the library that there exists such a vulnerability without sharing the information about this vulnerability. And then later, they can actually further get involved into a, a fair exchange protocol to get a bug bounty at the same time of the vulnerability disclosure. So that is the a second variant of the application of zero-knowledge proof for dynamic analysis. So, well, that's a very interesting application, but again, uh, what are the challenges, right? So, uh, in short, the challenges is still the same. The efficiency and scalability of general purpose zero-knowledge rules. But one thing I want to highlight that is actually slightly different from the machine learning uh, example, uh, especially for the neural network case, is that here, the challenge is on the computation model of the zero-knowledge proofs. So for almost all the uh, zero-knowledge proof schemes we've seen so far, we are computing on the so-called circuit model, or R1CS, or the Planckish atomization with special gates. But uh, either way, we are using a, a circuit model of the computation with these addition gates and modification gates and some generalized gates. But the computation we are trying to support, like program execution or program analysis, is usually in the RAND model, random access memory. So if we naively implement a RAND computation using an automatic circuit, there could be a huge blow up on the size of the circuit. A simple example is the binary search. Right? The running time of a binary search is only logarithm in the random access the memory model. But if you implement it as a circuit, the best you can do is just a linear scan, which is a linear in the size of your, your database. And that is an exponential blow up in the size of the circuit. So that is the challenge to apply zero knowledge proof for program analysis. And the key idea uh, that I want to highlight for this application is something called auxiliary input although it's also quite commonly used for general purpose zero knowledge proof. But I just want to explain this concept here. So the idea is that instead of implementing the original computation, which may not be very efficient in, in the circuit model, we can ask the prover to provide some additional data as the input to the circuit and to the zero knowledge proof. And these inputs are uh, usually called the auxiliary inputs. But they are not trusted and they're not sent directly to the verifier. You can view them as part of the witness owned by the proof. And the sole so purpose of these additional inputs is to actually transform the original computation that were, was not, cannot be efficiently supported by a circuit to an equivalent computation that can be efficiently implemented as a circuit. And so that when you uh, construct zero-knowledge proof on top of the new version of the circuit, it will lead to a zero-knowledge proof uh, scheme with a much better efficiency and scalability. So that is the idea of uh, auxiliary input. And uh, to give an example uh, for that, so here I'm using an example from the program a static program analysis uh, domain called worklist algorithm. And that is quite a standard one uh, in the literature, and I'm not going to uh, explain too much of the backgrounds here. So very roughly speaking, we have the source code of a program. And in this example, it's just a simple program with the six lines of code. And we can actually compute the control flow graph of this program. Like each line of code can potentially lead to these other lines of the code. Then the work list algorithm is used to analyze, for example, the, to perform the interval analysis or tentative analysis. And the process is that to actually implement this data structure like a queue. So then we, we are going to initialize the states of the, all the variables, x1, x2, and x3 in the program. And then uh, start from the first line of the code, one to, uh, line 1 to line 2. And then we are going to go to the like, control uh, flow graph of this um, uh, program and retrieve the corresponding uh, possible next lines of the code and push them to the end of the queue. And then based on the state of the, uh, this work list, we're going to update the state of these variables into a new state. 
And then we are going to remove the first element from the queue. And then we are going to repeat it again and again until this uh, kind of queue is uh, uh, fully uh, uh, filled. And then later, eventually, we will actually pop all possible uh, executions. And then the queue will become uh, empty eventually. And that will lead to the final state of all the variables. And then from this final state, we can have some additional algorithm to tell whether this program uh, is uh, secure or not from the tent analysis or interval analysis. So that's a very kind of brief uh, introduction of this uh, work list algorithm. But the key point is that the data structure of a, of a list or a queue cannot be efficiently supported if you implement it naively as a circuit. So uh, I think if you do it naively, the circuit size would become a uh, quadratic in the side in the time in the running time of the algorithm. Okay. And the solution using auxiliary input is as follows. You can actually ask the prover to provide the final state of this list. And it also provides the head and tail of each step of updating this list. And the circuit can actually check the correctness of these transitions using some um, uh, well-known techniques in the literature called offline memory checking, which was proposed in this paper by, uh, uh, in, in 1991 uh, and later refined by SETI in 2020 in the paper Spartan. Uh, then with this uh, additional information from the prover, it is actually possible to design a circuit to check the consistency of the memory updates and the final solution, the total running time is only order of t times v plus t times log t, where t is the running time of the program and v is the number of variables in the program. And note that the original work list algorithm in the plain text already takes order of t times v, and there's only a logarithmic overhead when you're transforming this computation to the corresponding circuit, which is actually much better than the naive approach with the quadratic blow up. And if you're interested in uh, the, 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 the technical protocols uh, of the solution, please feel free to refer to the corresponding papers that I'm going to show you next slide. So for related works, for static analysis, um, there is a, so there was a, a paper in 2021 by Fang, uh, Doris, Nier, and Zhang. And also uh, last year there was a, a very nice paper by Lu et al. on zero knowledge proof for unset equation that was, that was the best paper in last year's CCS. And there they propose a very efficient uh, way of proving the result of uh, uh, uns uh, unset, uh, which can actually be used to prove that there is no vulnerability of the corresponding program represented by the, this uh, system of uh, unset equations. And on the dynamic analysis side, there are two actually very uh, nice papers in the literature. First one by Green et al, uh, proving the vulnerability and also the disclosure in zero knowledge proof. And more recently, there's a paper by uh, Kuehler, Harris, uh, Parker, uh, Pernsteiner, and uh, Tromer, uh, scaling the uh, proof to even proving some uh, vulnerabilities in existing libraries in practice, such as uh, OpenSSL. So that concludes the second application of zero knowledge proof for program analysis. So in the last several minutes, I just want to highlight another cool application called zero knowledge proof for middle box. So what is a middle box? A middle box is something between your local device and the internet to inspect the traffic to ensure the security policy. For example, the middle box will check the uh, IP address or the URL you're trying to visit. Uh, to see that, uh, so that uh, it, this should not be from a list of a pro prohibited uh, websites. You can also analyze maybe the pattern or the port or the, the, the of your traffic uh, to ensure that you're not under some cyber attack. So that is a, a critical component uh, of our network. But now the challenge is that um, for uh, critical applications, we are uh, moving towards the so-called encrypted traffic such as HTTPS using the TLS 1.3 protocol. And that is actually a very good uh, practice uh, for security reasons. We should encrypt all of our packets so that uh, the attacker should not be able to infer any information if they're listening to the 
uh, internet. But the challenge then now is that once your packets are encrypted, how can the middle box check the content of these packets to ensure the security policies? You couldn't do it anymore because the packets are encrypted now. Of course, you can do some compromise or trade-off in between. For example, you can encrypt the content of the, the, the messages, but still review uh, the IP address and the port and the protocol you're supporting to the middle box. So that will uh, kind of reduce the confidentiality of your packets a little bit, but also increase the uh, security policy enforcement a little bit for the middle box. So it's uh, more of a trade-off between confidentiality of your uh, data and the security ensured by the policy. But can we do better than that? Can we achieve the best of both, both worlds instead of uh, making a, a trade-off? And the answer is yes, again, using zero-knowledge proof. And this was a very nice application proposed in this uh, interesting paper by Grubbs, uh, Arun, Zhang, uh, Beno, and uh, Wolfish. So there they designed this uh, entire kind of uh, uh, protocol for zero-knowledge middle boxes. So now, uh, instead of uh, decrypting your packets on the middle box side and check the policy, you can ask the device to generate a zero-knowledge proof, proving that the content encrypted inside this uh, packet satisfy the original set of uh, rules in the security policy. Okay. And the device is going to send the encrypted message together with this zero-knowledge proof to the middle box. And all the middle box needs to do is to verify the proof of this zero-knowledge proof. And if that returns accept, it means that the message behind this encryption satisfies this set of uh, security policies. And at the same time, the message, which is actually a witness of the zero-knowledge proof, remains completely confidential to the middle box and to the public. So in this way, we can actually ensure the confidentiality and the security simultaneously without any trade-off between them. So that is a very cool application of zero-knowledge proof. And uh, here I won't go into details of the, the constructions given the time limit. So I'm just uh, kind of highlight the, the, the challenges uh, in this uh, work. So the main challenge is mainly from the network protocol level. So we are talking about uh, enforcing the security policy for the packets during the transmission of a network uh, protocol. So it has to be compatible with this uh, TLS 1.3 specifications and also the HTTPS uh, protocols and so forth, which means that inside zero-knowledge proof, it has to support the legacy cryptographic functions such as the AES and the SHA hash functions. And we can, uh, you cannot use uh, tailored hash functions for uh, snark-friendly or circuit-friendly uh, primitives uh, with much better efficiency because these are not standard and these are not compatible with the TLS uh, 1.3 protocol. And the paper has many great optimizations uh, for these legacy cryptographic functions and also make the entire thing compatible with the existing uh, TIS 1.3 standard. And uh, please refer to the paper for more details if you're interested. So yeah, that completes uh, the discussion of uh, applications of zero-knowledge rules beyond blockchains and cryptocurrencies. Thank you for listening.